grace and peace be multiplied to each of you this evening in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me begin tonight by publicly expressing my gratitude to Dr. Davies and to all the team responsible for me having another opportunity to stand behind this prayer desk to be a part of this great conference and to open God's word with you and for you tonight. If you don't mind, I'm eager to preach. If you get your copy of God's word, we'll get right to it. Let me pray, and I want to point your attention to the New Testament book of Colossians. And then after we have prayed, and I want you to hear the reading of God's word, Together we'll consider tonight what God will say to us right out of what he has already said to us in his holy word. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, you are indeed great and greatly to be praised. Your greatness is unsearchable. From the place where the sun rises to the place where the sun goes down, Your name alone is worthy to be praised. We have many reasons to praise you. Above all, we praise you tonight for the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our all-sufficient prophet, priest, and king. It is our prayer tonight that our worship would go higher as you deepen our understanding of your word. Open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things about the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you would guide my thoughts, guard my heart, and govern my words so that I will only speak those things that are consistent with sound doctrine. Grant that I would not say anything that is untrue or unwise or unhelpful. And in all things, we pray that Christ alone would be exalted as the word is explained. Amen. Colossians chapter 1, I want to talk to you tonight about the foundation of Christian ethics. From Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. Hear the reading of God's word. He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. The word of God. Amen. In my hometown, a church building in the inner city was flattened by the 1994 North Ridge earthquake. The church had money to purchase new property, in fact, right across the street from their collapsed building, and it would actually allow them to build a bigger building. The building process began and then abruptly halted. I never knew all of the details, but the story was that in the initial stages of the building process, soil treatment tests revealed problems that prevented them from laying the foundation. And with the money and the materials and the manpower, 
the project was delayed for years because they couldn't lay the foundation. That story of the church building is a parable of church life. In some instances, a sad parable of church life. It reminds us tonight, friends, that the stability of the foundation determines the strength of the building. How should we live? That's the all-important question of Christian ethics. How should we live? And I declare tonight the church alone has the proper answers to that question. We must not be so eager to erect the building that we don't do the proper soil tests and make sure we are building on the right foundation. Belief, right belief, shapes right behavior. Truth governs life. Christian theology determines Christian ethics. And so tonight, I just want us to do a soil test and remember the foundation of Christian ethics. Nothing mysterious tonight. I want to just plainly declare that Christ himself is the foundation of Christian ethics. It is rooted in Christ himself. That's the message of Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 20. As I mentioned, it is in a real sense a soil test that reveals whether or not we are building on the right foundation. While under house arrest in Rome, the apostle Paul received news about the church at Colossae. Epaphras reported to Paul good news, basically, about their faith in Christ Jesus, and their love for all the saints. But there was also disturbing news. False teachers had infiltrated the church, and they were proclaiming a Christ who, though he may be prominent, he was not preeminent. They claimed that Christ was just one of many angelic emanations of God. And their errors about the person of Christ opened door, the door for confusion about the gospel, about the church, and about the Christian life. Various isms had infiltrated the church. Scholars are not sure how to distinguish what the true or ultimate problem was, and so it's just generally called the Colossian heresy. It was a multitude of isms that had infiltrated the church, and no one in particular was proclaimed to replace Christ worse. They were all presented alongside of Christ as if Christ is not enough. After receiving this report, Paul was moved to write this letter to the young church to declare and defend both the supremacy and the sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's be clear. Colossians is polemical. It confronts error. It exposes untruth. But in this first text of the main body of the letter, before he refutes the error, he declares the truth. It is a reminder that our job as the church in the world is not merely to shout at the darkness, we need to turn on the light. Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 20, is one of the most essential statements about Christ in all of the New Testament. The text at the same time is also one of the most debated texts in the New Testament because of its lofty language and its daring claims. It is suggested that these verses may record 
an ancient hymn that the early church sang in corporate worship. We're not sure about that, but even if this text is not derived from the worship of the church, it ought to result in the worship of the church. The worship of Christ should overflow into witness for Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 Chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, declares and defends the foundational truth that we must hold on to, that we must build on in Christian ethics. Namely this, Christianity is Christ and Christ is God. Christianity is more than a doctrinal statement. It is more than a moral code. It is more than a religious ceremony. Christianity is Christ and Christ is God. And our view of Christ must shape, must govern, must determine our view of everything else. And in these verses, Paul makes two big statements about the supremacy of Christ. I was given the time limit before I arrived, but pastor said I could preach as long as I want, so buckle up. <laughs> but as quickly as I can, two, two essential foundational truths about Christ in these verses. First, there is a statement about the supremacy of Christ over creation. The supremacy of Christ over creation. Verse 15 begins by saying he is the image of the invisible God. There are two affirmations here, one about God and then one about Christ. Concerning God, the text says God, in this opening phrase, God is invisible. John 4, 24 says God is spirit. 1 Timothy chapter 1, 17 says God is invisible. 1 John chapter 4, verse 12 says no one has ever seen God. There are theophanies in the Old Testament, these temporary and supernatural manifestations of God, but, but no one has seen God's essential nature. But after declaring that God is the invisible, the, the phrase that lays the foundation for all else that will be said in this text is that Christ is the image of that invisible God. Image it is the term from which we get our word icon. It is the representation of a thing, the manifestation of a thing. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4 commands, you shall not make for yourself any carved image. God says, don't you speculate what my image is. Because nothing you create representing anything in the sea, or on the land, or in the air can faithfully or fully represent who I am. Genesis 1.27 says that we were created in the image of God. And after his own likeness. Being made in the image of God, we are rational beings with emotion and intellect and volition. But, but we do not share God's image essentially. That There are incommunicable attributes of God that infinitely separates him from the created order of mankind. We do not share the image of God essentially, and we do not share the image of God morally. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But Paul says, there is one who is the image of God. Jesus Christ is the image of God, essentially and morally. John 1, 18 says, No one has seen God but the, the only God 
who is in the bosom of the Father has declared him, has made him known. That's our term for exegesis, bringing out of the text what's in the text rather than imposing your own idea on the text. Literally, John says that Jesus is the exegesis of God. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. Hebrews 1, 3 says that he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus is the image of God. Remember in the upper room, Jesus kept uh, my father this, my father that, and I guess the boys couldn't take it. And finally, Philip says, enough with all of this father talk. Just show us the father. <laughs> and it will satisfy us. John 14, 9, Jesus says, Philip, have you been so long with me and don't know who I am? You, you, you are asking an elementary question on graduation day. <laughs> you, you've been with me all this time and don't know who I am, but whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Just think of the magnitude of that statement. I am my father's son and namesake. He's been with the Lord many years. But when I go home to Los Angeles, I inevitably encounter those who say, boy, you remind me so much of your daddy. You are just like your daddy. When you preach, I, I just can't help but see your daddy. That, uh, that may be true, but I could never dare say, if you've seen me, you have seen my father. Think of the magnitude of what Jesus is declaring. He is saying, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Paul explains it here by saying, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. The Jehovah Witness twists this statement to suggest that Jesus is God's first creation. That would be for Paul to agree with the false teachers he writes to rebuke and betray the content and context of the passage that we are studying tonight. When he says that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, he is not referring to first in order. In that, refer in that regard, Cain is the firstborn of creation. He is not firstborn in order, but this is a statement about him as firstborn in rank. In a real sense, it is declaring that Christ has the Father's sovereign birthright. Exodus chapter 4, 22, God calls Israel my firstborn. In Psalm 89, verse 27 he says of David that he will be my firstborn, the king greater than all the rest of the kings. It's a statement of rank. And when the text here calls Jesus Christ the firstborn of all creation, Paul is declaring that Jesus himself is Lord of creation. What does that mean? It means, first of all, Jesus Christ created the world. In fact, verse 16 states Jesus' relationship to creation three ways. It says, first of all, Jesus is the source of creation. For by him all things were created. Who made the world? Who piled up the mountains? Who scooped out the valleys? Who gave the seas and the rivers and the oceans their course? Paul declared that everything in the created world is stamped with the same brand made by Jesus.
By him all things were created. He is the originator of all things. He is the architect of all things. He is the builder of all things. Jesus created the physical world. That's what he means here when he speaks of on earth and visible. Everything in the physical world around us was created by Jesus. Robert Gromacki comments here, people should praise him when they view the minute complexities of life through a microscope or the vastness of the universe through a telescope. Glory should be attributed to him, not a series of angelic emanations or to an impersonal mother nature, nor to an atheistic principle of evolution. Jesus made it all. He not only made the physical world, but Jesus created the spiritual world. That's what Paul means when he says in heaven and invisible. And then, just in case that's not clear enough, he gives four categories. Thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities. These overlapping terms declares that Jesus is the creator of not just the physical world that we can see around us, but the spirit beings in the unseen spirit realm. The false teachers, hear me tonight, church. The false teachers were claiming that Jesus was just an angelic emanation of God. Paul says, no, that can't be true. He made the angels. In fact, all of the fallen angels under the authority of Satan were created by the Lord Jesus Christ and are subject to his sovereign authority. Don't discount the magnitude of that statement, friends. Mark it down. Christian ethics is spiritual warfare. This is more than an intellectual or doctrinal or theological exercise. It is spiritual warfare against the flesh, the world, and the devil. And we are victorious only because greater is he that is in us than he who is in the world. Jesus is the source of creation. He is the agent of creation. All things, still verse 16, were created through him. That's what John 1, 3 says. All things were created through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says, Long ago, and many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, and through whom also he created the world. Jesus is the source of creation. Jesus is the agent of creation. And Jesus is the goal of creation. Look at the end of verse 16. All things were not just created through him. All things were created for him. It's all for his pleasure, his purpose, his praise. Oh, don't be discouraged because it doesn't look that way now. Just hold fast to Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and has given him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadems and crown him Lord of all. Jesus 
is the creator of the world? Verse 16, then verse 17 says, Jesus is the sustainer of the world. He is before all things. He, he predates and antedates all creation. John 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus, John 8, was arguing with unbelieving Jews. And really, they, they, they lost track of the argument itself. They were offended by the way Jesus was talking, not just what he was saying. They, they, they were offended by the way he was talking. You, you talking about Abraham like you know him. He's been dead for centuries, and you barely 30 years old. <laughs> Remember his response? John 8, 58, truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He is before all things. I remember distinctively, seventh grade, the first time I was confronted directly with the claims of atheistic evolution. I, I remember, I can see it now, seventh grade, my junior high school, it was my favorite teacher that year. And I was shocked in that science class. He began to deny everything that I had been taught and believed in the Bible. I was shocked and admittedly, I was, I was scared. I remember another young lady in the class, I knew that she also was a believer. And she spoke up using scientific mumbo jumbo, he shut her down. And I just determined I wasn't going to say anything. But I think about that encounter all the time. You know, sometimes we're real good at arguments after it's over and we can go back and think about what we should have said. <laughs> I just wish that day I just would, just would remember that, that science doesn't have all the answers. Science doesn't have all the answers. Space consists primarily of matter. Explain that one. Science struggles with that question. Colossians answers how that's possible. Colossians 117 says, and he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. Hallelujah. The Christ who is the sustainer, is the creator of creation, is the sustainer of creation. He is the one who holds all things together. How is it that the world is a cosmos and not a chaos? He holds all things together. How is it that earth remains close enough to the sun that we don't freeze and far enough away that we don't burn? Let me give you the scientific answer. He holds all things together. How is it that the sun keeps rising in the east and going down in the west? How is it that winter, spring, summer, and fall keep passing in their order? How is it 
that the flowers keep budding, blooming, fading, and falling. It's because he holds all things together. That's no abstract statement either, friend. That, that's a truth with which we need to view the rest of the world around us. You can't turn on the news without feeling that the world is falling apart. But beyond the breaking news, we need to look to the heavens and remember that the one seated at the Father's right hand is holding all things together. Sometimes we struggle with why things are as bad as they are, but can I flip the record over and play the other side and suggest that things are as well as they are? Because he's holding all things together. In fact, I'm talking to some pastor, some ministry leader. You drug yourself here for some encouragement to help you hang in there. May I suggest in your life and family and ministry, the only reason things are not utterly falling apart is because Christ is holding all things together. He is supreme. over creation, but there is a second truth. In verses 15 through 17, Paul declares the supremacy of Christ over creation, but in verses 18 through 20, he proclaims the supremacy of Christ over the church. Verse 18 presents three titles for Christ. He is the head of the body of the church. It's interesting, in the New Testament, Paul does not define the church as much as he describes the church with picturesque metaphors, an army, a family, a temple. And we find here the, the primary metaphor for the church in the New Testament, it is a body. The church is a body. It is a living organism, not a dead organization. And often when the church is presented as a body, the emphasis is on the, the mutual dependence of the members one for another. But here, Paul mentions the church as a body to declare the total dependency of the body on its head. He is the head of the body, the church. And no, head here does not merely mean source, it's authority. When he says he's the head, he means Jesus is in charge of the church. Don't apologize for that truth, saints. Anything without a head is dead. Anything with more than one head is a monster. Christ is the head of the church. He is the beginning. That's what he declares in Revelation 22, 13. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last, the beginning and the end. He's the firstborn from the dead. Revelation 1, 17, 18, where he says to, to John, do not fear. I am the first and the last, the living one. Revelation 1.18, I, when it he, when he says that he's the firstborn from the dead, he explains it in Revelation 1.17 and 18. He says, I was dead. Hallelujah. Jesus is the only one who can die and live to tell about it. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. He affirms these titles for this purpose to declare that in him all, he is to have supremacy. He, in all things, might be preeminent. In all things he might be preeminent says that in everything that happens in the life of the church, Jesus is to have first place, full control, and final authority. Not, not just church. First and 
creation first in church, and he is to be first in your life. This is a reminder, though, church, because there's all kinds of trouble Paul will have to correct in this letter. A lot of ethical issues to discuss. But he begins in the foundational statement of the main body of this letter by pointing them to Jesus. The couple picked up their son from Sunday school. Teacher pulled it aside and said, you need to talk to your son. We were in class and I was doing an object lesson and I asked what's small and furry and collects nuts in the winter and goes into a tree and stores them up and your son answered Jesus. <laughs> they marched him to that car And they fussed at him all the way out of the parking lot on the way home. How dare you embarrass us like that in that Sunday school class. They think you have no home. To when he couldn't take it anymore, he said, Mom and Daddy, I knew she was talking about a squirrel, but she should have been talking about Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. I mean, that's the spirit <laughs> of what Paul is doing in this text. We, we are preoccupied with a lot of things, but the answer to all of the problems we face is the same, Jesus. We should be talking about Jesus. He is to be preeminent. Let nothing in the church be treated as if it is more important than Jesus. Why? For two reasons he gives in the text. Why should Christ be preeminent in the church? First, he says, because of the incarnation of Christ. For verse 19, in him all the fullness of the God of God was pleased to dwell. What a statement. In fact, this is just as much of a statement about the Father as it is about Christ. It's, it's the Father's role in the incarnation of Christ. The, the Father dwelt in Christ. John 1, 14. John 1, 14 says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God dwelt in Christ. God was pleased to dwell in Christ. Matthew 3, 17, he declares, this is my beloved son, in whom I am what? Well pleased. He dwelt in him, he was pleased to dwell in him. And then Paul says, all of the fullness of God dwelt in him. Paul fleshes out that statement in chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, where he says, For in him, Christ, the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Let me just make a connection to Colossians, from Colossians 1 to Colossians 2 and remind you, that the supremacy of Christ fuels the sufficiency of Christ. Because he is who he is, he alone is everything we need. You are complete in him. And so there is a statement here about the incarnation of Christ in verse 19, and then finally, he should be preeminent not only because of his incarnation, but because of his atonement. Verse 20 is a statement about reconciliation. And reconciliation assumes that a relationship has been broken or ruptured or dislocated. This is the human predicament. This is the real problem.
It is more than political or racial or economic or educational or social. The, the problem is a spiritual one. Sin has separated man from God. Our sin makes us re rebels against God. We live in a society that has declared war against God. Go to Psalm 2, and here the psalmist asks, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The rulers take counsel together, and the kings set themselves against the Lord and against his anointed. And yet it is the pleasure of the Father to be reconciled to sinners, and he has provided the means of that reconciliation. Verse 20, through him Christ, God was reconciling to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. He reconciled to himself all things. Just note that, all things, not just Sinners, praise God, sinners are reconciled to God by the atoning blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the text says that through Christ, God reconciles all things to himself. That does not mean that unrepentant sinners or fallen angels will enjoy heavenly glory. It means that the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus is God's declaration that he has everything under control. And all things will be ordered according to his good pleasure in Christ. He has done it by the blood of his cross. Interesting, Paul talks much about the blood of Christ and often about the cross of Christ. It is a rare statement here where he blends them together and mentions the blood of his cross. It is by the blood of the cross that all things are reconciled to God. So what is our response to that? What should our response to that be? In 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21, Paul says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on the behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The novelist Lloyd Douglas told of living in a boarding house when he was in college. He says on the first floor there was a retired music teacher that he befriended and they had a morning ritual. Before he left he would come into the old man's room and just stick his head in the door and ask, what's the good news today? And the old man would take his tuning fork and tap it on the side of his wheelchair and say, young man, the good news today is that's middle C that you just heard. It was middle C yesterday. It's middle C today. It'll be middle C a thousand years from now. The tenor upstairs sings flat. The piano down the hall is out of tune, but this young man is middle C. Christ is the middle C of the universe. Tune everything by him. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for Jesus. Your Son, our Savior, you sent into the world 
who lived a righteous life without spot or blemish, who died at the cross to make atonement for our sins, who rose from the dead triumphantly, who has ascended to your right hand, who even now is making intercession for us, who will return to rapture the saints, consummate the kingdom, and judge the world. We are distracted, we are troubled, we are burdened by so many realities in the God-ignoring, God-forsaking society that we live in. But help us to set our minds on things above where Christ is, seated at your right hand. May Christ alone in his supremacy, in his sufficiency, in his sovereignty, be the foundation upon which we build our lives and our families and our churches to the glory of your name, we pray. And may the transforming power of your rescuing grace in Christ advance in this sinful world. We pray rejoicing that no matter how bad things are around us, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. Even tonight as we have beheld Christ, transform us from one state of glory to the next. By the work of your spirit and for the praise of your glory, we pray. Amen.